I'm Konstantinos Filis, and I'm very glad to be moderating uh, a panel with uh, distinguished uh, speakers uh, on uh, the geopolitical implications and the new balance uh, in the Middle East uh, following Lausanne Treaty. As you do know, and uh, has already been discussed, Lausanne Treaty uh, is, among other things, the birth certificate of uh, modern Turkey. Uh, and, uh, of course, it uh, defined the course of events uh, to uh, a big extent, uh, not only on Turkey, but uh, on its neighborhood. Um, with uh, uh, no further ado, since uh, we don't have time, and I would like to kindly ask our speakers not to exceed eight minutes in their first uh, interventions, uh, because I uh, prefer that we have uh, ample time for uh, Q&A uh, with uh, the audience. Uh, and please, you know, I hold the gun. If you exceed eight minutes, uh, I'll uh, make sure that um, you, uh, uh, you know, you finish on time. Um, so uh, let's start with um, George Prevelakis, uh, who is a professor uh, emeritus at uh, uh, Sorbonne University, uh, Paris 1, uh, and, Moldo, and also distinguished uh, visiting professor at the Hellenic American University. And uh, the topic of uh, his uh, speech is the death of the archipelago. Uh, professor Prevelakis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I would like also to thank her for this uh, invitation. This is a very important and uh, interesting uh, meeting. Uh, the Lausanne Treaty uh, is among other things, in my view, the, the culmination of the Westphalian uh, process, of the Westphalization of the world. Uh, <clears throat> we have with the Lausanne Treaty, we have all the elements of the West Westphalian um, principle, uh, which of course corresponds to a vision, I would say, to a platonic vision, a vision of a closed, stable world. But of course, the world is not stable, is not, uh, it changes, it has been changing uh, since uh, that time, and uh, uh, we need to uh, think about also other paradigms and other systems of organization of space, of political and economic organization of space. And what I submit is that uh, uh, the concept of the archipelago offers uh, such an alternative uh, paradigm uh, and uh, that uh, it has uh, a very important symbolic uh, content which of course is symbols are extremely essential uh, in uh, organizing our minds and our worlds. So uh, what uh, the archipelago is not uh, is something is a concept or a term that appears in, in Italy in the 17th century. And uh, since then it appears again and again, for example, uh, so you see we have uh, uh, Jules Verne, uh, uh, the archipelago on fire, a very uh, interesting uh, uh, story. Uh, and also, uh, and also uh, another reference is from Halford Mackinder, the father of the British uh, geography who says, uh, mentions, uh, mentions the archipelago and makes reference to the birthplace of, uh, uh, of uh, seafaring. So it is a major symbolic uh, reference of the, uh, of, I would say, the, the, the Western world. Uh, uh, what, uh, what is the meaning of, archi uh, of archipelago as a model? I think that it helps distinguish between a hierarchical uh, structure like the one which uh, uh, is behind the Westphalian concept and a network. Because an archipelago is a network, uh, it's not simply a series of islands. If we make reference to the uh, original, if you, if you like, uh, reference which is uh, the, the, the archipelago the, the, bet between, uh, between uh, the Balkans and the Asia Minor, it's not only the islands, it's also uh, the various uh, uh, port cities uh, around, around the sea. Uh, it has to do with the uh, physical structure of uh, the Mediterranean. This is something that Brodel has said, that the Mediterranean, in fact, is a, a set of islands, even if those islands uh, are on land, because the way what is important is how 
you move around how you circulate, and circulation was traditionally until the 19th century through the sea. So this means that we have a system, a territorial system, which is uh, based on a very uh, dynamic system of circulation, and this is what gives it uh, this uh, network um, uh, uh, structure. Uh, now, uh, this is uh, a heritage uh, uh, of Europe, of the Mediterranean, of the Ottoman Empire, of our world, a heritage that both Greek and Turkish uh, nationalism have done everything to destroy. And of course, the first, uh, the first step has been the creation of the Greek state, the Greek state which has been formed under the influence of the Bavarians and the, the Western powers. Uh, and uh, what was important for them was the reference to ancient Greece, because that was a myth essential for the European identity, and they used the case of Greece in order to give uh, substance to this myth. So the, the Greek state should correspond to this uh, ideological project, and therefore they created the Greek state, the Greek territory, uh, around the two references that they knew mostly, which was Athens and Sparta. Therefore, uh, from uh, a maritime, let's say, vaguely Greek, you see, we have a big problem about terminology, who are Greeks, who are not Greeks, who are Rome, who are the Albanian Romes in the Aegean. We have big problems of terminology once we are not in the framework, in the, in the clearly Westphalian framework. But uh, from this tradition of uh, uh, maritime presence uh, of the ancestors of, of the future Greeks, uh, we shifted to a territorial vision. Uh, and uh, since then, the, the life of, of Greece has been focusing on, uh, uh, on the territory, abandoning the, uh, the maritime tradition, and this, of course, had direct influence uh, on uh, the distribution of cities, of the population, etc. Now, with, uh, what is interesting with Venizelos' vision is that he tries to recreate an archipelagic Greek, Greece, which of course fails. And then we have uh, the, uh, uh, the defeat and the Lausanne Treaty. It's not simply that we have a border between Asia Minor and the islands. It is also because of the exchange of population, which means that the human networks that existed before have been destroyed, have been severed. And therefore, the, this is why I, uh, I gave this title, the, the Death of the Archipelago. Uh, and uh, of course, this goes on, this goes on. Uh, I would say, I, I think it's interesting to, to see that uh, it is a death which is not complete, because culturally, one has the feeling that it remains. If you compare the results of the last uh, Turkish elections and the map of the Greek, more or less, Greek presence in Asia Minor be before, uh, before the exchange of population, you see that there is a correspondence. So it means that there is a cultural continuity in Turkey, as in Greece, of the archipelagic uh, culture. Uh, but of course, uh, now we have gotten into a period in which uh, the maritime questions have taken another form because of the uh, uh, increased importance of the sea, which creates competition about resources, about uh, movement, circulation, control of I mean, all those things that we know about the if you like, the maritimization of, of, of our world, but also there's another phenomenon, which is the territorialization of the sea, the fact that uh, to the extent that we have the means to exploit the, the, the sea, we tend to cut it down as we used to do with the, with the, with the land. So we have those uh, phenomena that uh, uh, threaten even more uh, the, uh, uh, the archipelagic functioning uh, and logic. Uh, my conclusion is that uh, in spite of those difficulties and those uh, uh, losses, uh, we need to uh, maintain the memory of the, uh, of the concept of the archipelago 
by showing its historical importance and also by showing how it can be today uh, a way of seeing the world in a different approach than that of the Westphalia. Uh, because I believe that the two are complementary. If we go too far to the one direction, if we go too far to the logic of, uh, of Westphalia, we end up with wars between states. If we go too far in the logic of the archipelagic logic, as we have done during the globalization period, then we end up with crises like the ones we have today. And the problem of our world is to find a balance between the two. Uh, now the threat is that we are going to counter globalization and therefore to a fragmentation of the world. And in that sense, to preserve and remind the memory of the archipelago, I think is something extremely useful. Thank you very much. I hope I kept the time. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Premelakis, and for uh, restraining yourself and uh, respecting uh, time. And now uh, I will pass the floor to uh, John Sakas, Professor of History and Geopolitics at the University of the Aegean. Uh, the uh, subject of uh, his uh, intervention is the Treaty of Lausanne and Turkey's Middle East policy in the interwar period. Professor Sakas. Okay, thank you very much. Just here the PowerPoint. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for being here today to this very important uh, conference. I would like to thank also the organizing committee for inviting me to take part in this conference. Um, my topic is about the Treaty of Lausanne and how this treaty influenced uh, Turkey's Middle East policy. As you can see here, the Treaty of Lausanne, in, in fact, led the foundations for the international recognition of the sovereignty of the new Republic of Turkey as the successor state of the Ottoman Empire. Kemal Ataturk's two basic foreign policy goals were the following. The first one was to create a strong modern state which could defend its territorial integrity and political independence against external aggression and the second major goal was to make Turkey a full equal member of the Western European Community of Nations. During the Ottoman Empire, the grand ideas were three, the basic three, pan-Ottomanism, pan-Islamism, and pan-Turkism. These uh, grand ideas were replaced with the principles of republicanism, secularism, and nationalism. These new principles had a major impact on Kemal's domestic policy, as well as on the country's foreign policy. Thus, uh, from this perspective, there was a connection, a close connection, between domestic and foreign policy. And this is very important to understand. This is reflected in the famous maxim peace at home, peace in the world, connecting internal stability with the international peace and order. Here are some important characteristics of Turkey's foreign policy during the Ataturk era. The first characteristic is its peaceful nature, peace above all. The second characteristic was political and defensive realism. And the third one, the utmost importance it attributed to international law and legitimacy. And the fourth and the last characteristic of foreign policy was the priority it gave to regional and international cooperation and dialogue. As Ataturk once said, a direction of peace aiming at the security of Turkey and which is not against any nation will always be our principle. So, uh, okay, uh, I have here some examples of political realism versus ideological precepts or contentious sentiments and historical grants. Historical grants, I mean, for example, the Turkish against the Arabs, which is a traditional one. So, Ankara 
for example, established fruitful cooperation with the Soviet Union, despite the Turkish government's suppression of communism within the country, Turkey again initiated an rapprochement with Greece in 1930, and a bit later with France and uh, Britain, despite the bitter memories of the war years over Anatolia and the post-World War I partition plans that prompted it. And as well, a third one is that Ankara maintained friendly relations with fascist Italy and Nazi Germany. They have some common uh, things, common characteristics, uh, for example, extreme nationalism and national unity or the personality cult. In the 1930s, changes and developments in world politics required Turkey to make multilateral agreements to improve its security. So I have here two examples. In February 1934, the Balkan Pact was signed between Turkey, Greece, Yugoslavia, and Romania. And three years later, in July 1937, the Sadabad Pact was signed between Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Afghanistan. It was a very important uh, agreement which provided for mutual friendship and non-aggression, recognition of the current state borders, and uh, a military assistance in the case one of the four countries will be attacked by another non-allied country. So with these two pacts in 1934 and 1937, Turkey, and Turkey managed to a greatest possible extent to secure its borders both to the west as well as to the east. So security was the major aim of the new regime in Turkey. So the main question now is, what did the Treaty of Lausanne mean for Turkey's Middle East territories and policies? As you know well, Turkey ceded all claims on the Dodecanese Island, Cyprus, Egypt and Sudan, Syria and Iraq, and tried to settle the borders. And also, Turkey lost very important territories to the south of Syria and Iraq on the Arabian Peninsula, as you can see here. So these very important territorial losses, above all the handing of the Mosul region to Iraq in the 1925-1926 negotiations, and the inclusion of the district of Alexandretta in Syria, disappointed the new Kemalist regime. However, Turkey's core aim in the region did not change at all. There were three points important for Turkey. Stability, balance of power within the region, and no interference in the internal affairs of other countries. In the 1920s, Atatürk was occupied with the stabilization of the young nation and the overcoming of the so-called Sever syndrome. So Turkey was a wanton country, and Kemal had to focus on the reconstruction and development of Turkey. But Atatürk did not ignore the Middle East. There were border issues to be settled, particularly in relation to Iran and Iraq, while improving trade and transportation became a primary concern for Turkey in order to become a key player in the region. Here we have a photo showing the attempt of Kemal to make regional uh, links and connections, especially with countries like Iran or Iraq or Afghanistan, as it's here. You can see in the photo at Atatürk with King Amanullah Khan of Afghanistan in Ankara in 1928. This king, Amanullah, attempted to emulate Kemal's reforms, but at the end he was overthrown. Okay, just a few minutes. I'm reaching to some conclusions. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, <laughs> two minutes. Uh, I would like to stress some important points in two minutes. Uh, conclusions. First of all, it was the, the first point is that Atatürk remained very firmly abided to the terms of Lausanne regarding the new republic with firm borders, national independence, and security. Then, Turkey's interests in the Middle East during the 1920s and 1930s were very important. 
Some scholars have pointed out that uh, during the interwar years, Turkey did not give much emphasis on its Middle East policy. This is not true, and there is a recent book by Bain called, um, as you can see, Turkey in the Middle East, uh, Kemal is Turkey in the Middle East, a very important book which substantiates that Kemal showed a very great interest for the Middle East affairs. The last point, and I'm finishing with this, is that during the Cold War years, uh, Turkey began to distance itself from the Middle East affairs. This was a crucial point in the foreign policy of uh, Turkey in relation to the Middle East. And only in this century, and especially under President Erdogan, Turkey has started again to take a very great interest in Middle East affairs and has changed its policy in this region. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Sakas. Um, now I pass the floor to Ioannis Grigoriadis, um, a good friend. Uh, he uh, will talk about uh, Greek Turkey's strategic relations before and after the Treaty of Lausanne. Uh, Ioannis uh, is Associate Professor in Jean Monnet, uh, Chair of European Studies at the Department of Political Science and Public uh, Administration at Bilken University. And he's also a Senior Research Fellow and Head of um, the Turkey Program uh, at LMM. Thank you very much. Good morning, and uh, thank you for being with us this morning. I would like to raise a few opening remarks so that we can have a discussion, as Konstantinos suggested later, regarding the strategic relations between Greece and Turkey before and after the Treaty of Lausanne. The reason I chose this topic is because we take Greek-Turkish animosity for granted because of this very heavy, like, uh, last decades, sort of a diplomatic uh, uh, disputes and conflicts that have dominated the Greek mainly, but also to some degree the Turkish public sphere. And we kind of tend to forget that uh, relations were not always as tense and as problematic. And actually, in some contexts, the two countries uh, were close strategically because they had common security concerns and they sort of tried to address common issues uh, through cooperation. So, of course, it is important to start by stressing uh, uh, that the Treaty of Lausanne has been a milestone event in many aspects. Of course, it signals the end of the imperial like projects of both countries, the Megali there and the kind of the end of the Ottoman Empire officially uh, on the one hand, but also the sort of the consolidation of the nation building project in both uh, countries. It is important to remember that there is a paradox here that Greece and Turkey fought their independence wars to some degree against each other. So it's a very paradoxical situation, like Greece uh, establishing itself as a nation state against the Ottoman Empire, and then modern Turkey, like uh, Kemalist Turkey, fighting, consolidating itself against the Armenian uh, national movement and the Greek uh, national movement in Western Anatolia. So that's important to remember. Something that hasn't been discussed uh, yesterday in the conference, and I think it's important to uh, highlight that uh, we talked about population exchange, but the fact that the criterion for exchanges was religion and not ethnicity or language was also defining for both countries. The way that Greek and nation state was imagined was uh, based on this decision that has led to interesting repercussions. Because we talk about the role of religion in Greek politics. In Turkey, uh, Ataturk tried to promote a sort of uh, a radical version of secularism, which of course, in the context of Republican, in the, in the course of Republican history, it has been reconsidered, renegotiated, and we are now in a very different position when it comes to the role of Islam in Turkish uh, national identity. So uh, uh, what is also very important to highlight is that uh, despite the fact that the two countries uh, went out this, uh, kind of exited this decade of bitter conflict between the two, and I refer to the decade from 1912 to 1922. They were very quick in reestablishing relations and friendly relations a few years later. That sounds very difficult to conceive today, given the level of relations in the last decades. But it also shows uh, some degree statementship on the side of the leaders of the countries at that time, as well as the fact that both countries were appearing to be status quo forces in the interwar years. So 
Greece and Turkey were not interested in challenging the arrangements of the end of the First World War. They were not into uh, expansionist adventures. And there were countries in the region that were into this. Uh, Italy was one. And Greece and Turkey felt threatened by Italy at the same time. And of course, Bulgaria was the other country in the Balkans, because we normally, when we talk about Greek-Turkish relations, we normally focus on the Aegean. Uh, but uh, we need to consider that there is a Balkan dimension, and of course, Macedonia and position of Greece, and of course, Thrace was addressed in the Lausanne Treaty as well. So in that respect, Greece and Turkey appear to be trying to defend the arrangements of the end of the First World War against Bulgaria and against Russia. And in that respect, they appear willing to sign agreements and compromises that uh, may be unpleasant in, uh, in the domestic audience of both countries. Uh, yesterday, we discussed to some degree how this uh, population exchange agreement was thought by many to be not a final solution, that people will still be given somehow the chance to return, or at least the properties would be compensated, because that was an issue that remained and resolve the, La the Lausanne Treaty, given, of course, the difficulty of calculating the, the size of the properties to be uh, sort of uh, exchanged or sort of compensated. But in the end, the two countries decided to put state interest over individual interest and property rights in order to make a new beginning. And in that respect, it is interesting to see how uh, both countries joined the Balkan Pact and how both countries uh, de decided to develop a common security uh, agenda in the 1930s. And in that respect, let me raise a point that uh, you may, may be hearing about uh, when you hear about greek turkish disputes over the Aegean, the fact that Turkey didn't dispute Greece's unilateral uh, act to extend this uh, kind of uh, airspace to 10 miles in the 1930s in the, in the Aegean uh, is due to the fact that there was trust and in, in that respect, Italy was the common enemy. And in a sense, Turkey didn't feel threatened by the decision of Greece to extend its airspace to 10 miles because Turkey preferred Greece to be controlling more of the Aegean compared to Italy. So that was, of course, something that changed dramatically in the 1970s, and we'll come to this point. Of course, uh, there is another common security concern that emerges, which is the Soviet Union. Like in the end of the Second World War, Greece goes through a very, very bloody and uh, civil war. Turkey's uh, relations with the Soviet Union changes abruptly uh, from being the Turkey's first and most valuable ally in the war years uh, and a country that's willing to restore Ottoman uh, territories to the Republic of Turkey in Kars and Ardahan. Stalin appears now willing to take his territories back and sort of impose a new regime on the Straits. So this, of course, triggers Turkey's decision to abandon neutrality, which was Turkey's policy throughout the Second World War. Let me highlight here that, in a sense, Greece eventually was attacked by Italy, and this triggered Greece's entry into the Second World War, so the threat appeared to be a real one. But Turkey managed to navigate through uh, the Second World War, mainly through the, due to the very bitter experience of the First World War that proved to be a big disaster. The empire tried to recover its Middle Eastern and Balkan territories and ended up being roundly defeated. So there was some risk aversion there on the side of Ismet Inunu. But at, at some point, this risk aversion has to come to an end, and then uh, the Soviet threat is so big, and then the two countries uh, decide to join the Western Front, and they become members of NATO at the same time, right? So uh, again, there is this common Soviet threat that shapes Greek-Turkish uh, uh, foreign and security policy. And it's only, in my opinion, the outbreak of the Cyprus problem, which is, of course, a part of the whole the colonization process that is starting in the 1950s that brings these two countries against each other and to some degree revitalizes, revives this old animosity. So in, in that respect, the Cyprus problem becomes a miniature of the late 19th century Greek-Turkish conflict that brings all the uh, like, uh, old uh, negative feelings to the front 
and allows uh, the two countries to consider each other as a security sort of threat. And eventually, this has a negative spillover in all outstanding disputes. So the minority problems become profoundly affected by this. Then there is a sort of understanding of negative reciprocity when it comes to minority rights in two countries. So uh, this uh, puts the minorities in both countries under heavy pressure. And eventually, uh, of course, the Aegean disputes emerge since the 1970s as a sort of spillover again of the Cyprus problem. So what can the Lausanne Treaty sort of teach us about how to reshape Greek-Turkish strategic relations? I think it is important to keep in mind that in the Lausanne Treaty, both countries were willing to join a common security community and share some common values. Uh, this can be a sort of uh, yardstick on how we can imagine a sort of uh, a resolution of greek turkish disputes. So how can we start with, so for example, Turkey's uh, close relationship with the Western security community is very important, uh, but also agreeing on a common set of values, what is the international law, sort of the international principles that define international relations is something that we need to confirm in order to hope that uh, Greek and Turkish relations will no longer be remembered or will not remember forever as a relationship of two difficult neighbors. So thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Ioannis, uh, for uh, your uh, speech and uh, last but uh, certainly not least, uh, I say uh, Zara Kohl, Professor of International Relations at the University of Cambridge. Uh, her topic is Turkey in a period of disorder. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me frame my remarks by noting that I'm not a historian but uh, international relations scholar who's interested in the history of order, international order and disorder. So what I would like to do today is uh, first describe Turkey's foreign policy trajectory in the interwar era um, with some implications for the Middle East, though I'm not a Middle East scholar, um, and then ask if there are any lessons we can draw about Turkey's handling of the present period of disorder, which many see as comparable to the interwar uh, period. So as has been discussed throughout this conference, the Ottoman Empire was defeated in World War I, uh, lost most of its territories, uh, yet the Turkish forces under Mustafa Kemal were able to force out occupying armies uh, from what is modern day Turkey and sit down to negotiate a treaty with the great powers on their own terms. Um, what's sometimes forgotten, however, is that um, coming off such an unexpected victory, uh, it was anybody's guess what the Turks would do after uh, Lausanne. There was a lot of uncertainty about uh, Turkish foreign policy. Uh, in 1922, Venizelos had warned the British uh, there was nothing that could stop Mustafa Kemal from uh, turning against the Allies. Uh, he would by that time have his head swelled more than ever. Uh, he asked whether the British believed that Mustafa Kemal would hesitate to pursue actively the problem of reconquest of the Arab countries and engage in every kind of hostile action against the British Empire in the East. He was not wrong. Uh, before Lausanne and for some time after, uh, the British Empire had uh, two causes for real concern about the direction the new leadership in Turkey would take. Uh, first was the possibility that Turks would use their hold on the seat of uh, the Caliph to foment revolt among Muslims in the eastern colonies of the British Empire. This worry was constantly expressed in British reports during the war. Uh, for instance, in 1922, a British officer reported, uh, I have been convinced during this visit that there is a great Mohammedan movement on foot now directed against the British in India and in Mesopotamia. Uh, Kemal up to, until now has refrained from attacking England by means of the great weapon of Islam, but Kemal at dinner informs me that if now this time he does not get peace, he will use this weapon and it will have far and wide reaching results, great wars and bloodshed. This worry, which was also shared by France, is reflected in numerous discussions among the Allies and it was corroborated to some degree by the pressure Britain was getting from its Asian colonies to reach a settlement with Ankara. The other worry for Britain stemmed from the close relationship the Turks had established with the Bolshevik regime in Moscow, as discussed in some of the previous panels. 
uh, British intelligence reported the financial assistance Ankara was getting from the Bolsheviks, and Mustafa Kemal's impassioned speeches did nothing to quell the worry that Ankara was on its way to become uh, a satellite of Moscow. Uh, a 1922 British Secret Intelligence Service report uh, noted that Mustafa Kemal affirmed the of the unity of the Turkish army with the Russian army, which he stated formed one line of defense on the east from north to south. Turkey had come to realize that the forces at work against her were identical with those which were seeking to destroy Russia, and all Eastern nations were in the same position as Turkey, uh, menaced by the same enemy. Mustafa Kemal also used the influence Ankara had over the Middle East and the Muslim world as leverage in his discussions with Moscow. Uh, in 1921, he told Moscow's representative, the Yemenis came here as the subjects of the Ottoman Empire and declared their trust in the Ankara government. I told them we did not want their servitude. I instructed them to organize around the popular sovereignty movement, and maybe after that we could discuss a federation. Uh, yes, there is a nationalist government in Baghdad. They too came to me for assistance. In sum, as far as the West was concerned, even after the Treaty of Lausanne had been signed, the Turkish leadership in Ankara seemed that it could go over to the Bolshevik camp, camp and perhaps cause trouble in the Muslim world in addition. We all know how the story ends. By uh, the time of Atatürk's death in 1938, Turkey had moved away from Bos Moscow. Both the Sultanate and the Caliphate had been abolished. Turkey never tried to stir trouble in the East, but on the contrary pushed a strong peace agenda through the Sadabad and Balkan Pacts she spe spearheaded into existence. Turkey asked to join the League of Nations. Uh, the French Prime Minister noted in 1933, uh, seemingly relegated to Asia, Turkey, with her desire for order, peace, and progress, moves into Europe now. In the 1930s, Turkey was so active in the regional order pact, so th thoroughly committed to the process of Europeanization domestically, that it seemed impossible to believe that the country was still ruled by the same people who had been a thorn on, uh, in Europe's side slightly more than a decade before. So what happened? Ankara had enjoyed widespread uh, support from the Muslim world, uh, as noted. Once the final battle had been won, Ankara was flooded with telegrams of congratulations and visits from representatives of Muslim communities. However, relations started cooling off when Muslim representatives in Ankara became aware of the Turkish discussions to abolish the caliphate. Perhaps because uh, Ankara needed the support of Muslim communities during the negotiations in Lausanne, the office of the caliph was spared uh, when the office of the Sultanate was abolished in 1922. Ankara continued to attract and inspire representatives of Eastern communities. Uh, in the first couple of years, there were even those who came to declare their official loyalty uh, to Ankara and proposed uh, Mustafa Kemal should become the new caliph. Uh, nevertheless, the Turkish parliament uh, voted to end the office uh, of the caliphate uh, on March 3, 1924. British newspapers uh, considered this decision a strategic mistake. Both the Times and the Economist were under the impression that this was going to hurt Turkey's relations with the Sunni Muslim community, and also with the Muslim states that had been admirers of the new Ankara government, such as Egypt, Afghanistan, and Iraq, and to some extent, this did happen. Immediately after the Lausanne Conference, relations with uh, Turkey and Western powers, especially Britain, were lukewarm, uh, partly because of the Mosul, uh, dispute as discussed previously, uh, and diplomatic relations would not be improved until after the settlement uh, of, that, of that issue. Uh, second, Western observers were skeptical of the domestic reforms in Ankara. Uh, uh, the government was pushing you know, all these uh, domestic reforms in great speed in order to join the community of civilized nations. Um, but perceptions about the durability of these reforms started to change in the 1930s. Originally, the European press uh, had been skeptical uh, of these reforms because they were being imposed from above. Um, and some argued that, modern, that these modernization efforts would not succeed, and Mustafa Kemal was being oppressive and authoritarian. Others, uh, more friendlier observers, thought that Turkey should be congratulated uh, for trying anyhow. Um, in the, by the 1930s, the coverage in Europe regarding Turkey had become more positive. Um, in 1930, the Contemporary Review argued that Turkey and Japan were the most modern countries of uh, Asia. Um, Near East and India in 1933 observed that Turkey had made the transition from the Middle Ages to modernity in only a decade, and that now Turkey was a strong border guard in the <laughs> Near and Middle East. 
Uh, throughout the 1930s, Turkey was seen as a devoted facilitator of international peace. Um, the Morning Post declared Turkey to be the most peaceful country in Europe in 1937. So to reiterate, uh, Turkey could have chosen to align itself uh, with the Soviet Union. There were incentives to do so uh, or to play the caliph card. But uh, Turkey's priority or Ankara's priority at the time was acceptance and equal treatment uh, by the West. On several occasions, Ataturk said to his colleagues that they would join Moscow if necessary, but he always made it sound as if this was the less preferable uh, notion. Um, Turkey joined the League of Nations, even though the League, as an instrument of European power, had not treated Turkey favorably at all. Instead of actively fighting against Western imperialism, Turkey worked very hard to maintain the status quo in the Balkans and the Near East, contrary to the predictions of the early 1920s. In these ways, Turkey both benefited from the disorder of the interwar period and also helped create the post-World War II order. So let me just conclude by saying something uh, about whether uh, Turkey's foreign policy choices in this period is comparable uh, uh, to the present uh, era. Uh, obviously, you know, as many observe that we are again in a period of uh, disorder and adjustment, uh, the 1929 Gramsci quote applies just as well to our era as it did to the interwar period, at least the first part. The old world is dying, the new world struggles to be born. Now is the time of monsters. Um, uh, so, and some of the press coverage, I think, about Turkey being a border guard or uh, you know, playing different sides would not be out of place uh, today. Um, you know, Turkey is playing different uh, camps against each other while being primarily concerned about its own international standing. Uh, of course, there is a big difference between Mustafa Kemal and Recep Tayyip Erdogan, but I would posit that the main difference between the interwar period and the, our present one uh, is not about what's happening inside Turkey, but what is happening outside. Of course, Turkey has changed, but the international order itself has maybe changed more. Uh, the Europe and the West is no longer the draw it was 100 uh, years ago. Um, but once things settled, uh, the, the end result may be the same. Uh, Turkey, because of its liberal position, set, uh, benefits from unsettled periods and being able to leverage uh, different groups and camps against uh, uh, each other. Once things settle into bipolarity, uh, Turkey will likely be relegated again to the peripheral norm enforcer role that it was during the Cold War <laughs> on whichever side it is stuck on uh, when the new order emerges. Thank you.